Welcome to Bonus Sesh, everyone. I'm Danielle Schneider. Today, we have on a very special guest. Now, we've been trying to get this young lady on for a while, but the pro- on our regular bitch sesh, but she doesn't watch garbage television because she's a classy lady, not like us dump trucks of human beings. So, you know, we had to, we're putting on the bonus session so we can just talk to her about um, more erudite, is that the word? <laughs> uh, things. Now this, <laughs> This lovely woman is a very good friend of mine, um, but she's also someone I really look up to because she is a very talented actress, writer, producer, director. Perhaps you've seen the show that she co-created with Jessica St. Clair, another good friend of the pod. She had two of them, actually. One, her first one called Best Friends Forever, and then Playing House, which I was lucky enough to work on. Um, and she also, you probably star saw her star last year in the show, Bless This Mess on Fox, which she also directed episodes of. Hello. She's on every funny show. She's so good on the show, Veep. She's also just an amazing human being and mother. So let's bring her on Lennon Parham. Did you write that? That was like... No, it came off the tip of... Just print it out and I'm going to give it to someone (laughs) at my funeral and say, just read this. Just read this. Came off the the tippy top of my H. Thank you. Um, And you meant head, not hole, right? (laughs) No, I didn't mean my hole. Okay, cool. (laughs) It came off the top of my hole. (laughs) No, you you got it right. Your instinct was correct. Yeah. Um, Lennon, so you are, do you watch, let me ask you this though, because we are a garbage show. Sure. Do you watch any garbage or is it all straight, um, Shakespeare? <laughs> I watch, you know me, I'm always like streaming Shakespeare from like various yeah. libraries. <laughs> like I from the old specifically globe. like it in old English. I don't, I don't ever <laughs> want, yeah, I don't want it modernized. You know, I want it no. down and dirty. Um, no, I like, okay, so I watch reality TV competitions primarily and specifically ones where there are people who are incredibly good at what they do mm-hmm. um, competing. So RuPaul's Drag Race, Obsessed. Oh, you love RuPaul's Drag Race. I forgot about that. Yes. You love that. All Stars, uh, RuPaul, you know, All Star Drag Race, Obsessed. Um Great British Bake Off, obsessed. That's like my comfort food right now. Um, I was totally into Project Runway, less so the All Stars. That's whatever we can talk about it. Um, yeah, and Top Chef, obsessed. All Top Chef, All Stars, mm-hmm. all the yeah. So that's the kind of that's so what not, I traffic in. Yeah, you you like talent before talent is important to you is what I'm hearing. Yeah, you know I I. I've, I have a hard time watching like garbage people, like spending mm-hmm. my time with that, with them, which I think could probably <laughs> be alienating to most of the listeners of this podcast. But that feels like I've, I feel like I've made it like such a, such an important part of my own personal life to remove garbage <laughs> people. Like, that then to so come why would you let them in through like half an hour or an hour or out multiple hours because it is like letting vampires into your house like once bit. you let it in like it comes you gotta in let and it i in. will say that yeah you, you gotta let the, the right red one, one, one let the red right one in yes <laughs> Um, because it is funny. I, I almost consider people that like garbage TV. It's like cilantro. Some people can handle, yeah. and, like, I can't do cilantro. Like I yeah. just don't have it. It bothers me where some people Tastes like, like the garbage people to them. Yeah. So the garbage thing, it's like, it's damaging to their psyches. Like they can't, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and that it's like cilantro, I feel like. And I so it's if, very interesting. I, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know if it's like an empathy thing or if it's like, Maybe, I don't know, maybe it's being on the side of like knowing how the, how the bread gets made or something. Do you know what I mean? For mm-hmm. being an, an in, mm-hmm. a, like a entertainment insider. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm trying to think like I did, there were a couple of times, like, do you remember that show starting over? It yes, was like, okay, so like in the early to mid 2000s, it was, it was an early, mm-hmm. it was a daily show about 
Six yes. women living in a house, starting over. And the Jan Van Zan and Rhonda um, were a part of it. And they were their counselors. And they like, it was just, it was, I mean, it wasn't, I don't know. It was like they they were going to therapy. They were working stuff out. There was house drama. Like I, mm-hmm. like, I was into that. I was really into that. Mm-hmm. But again, it did take over my life. Yeah, well, that I remember, yes, in the early aughts. I feel like I was watching that when I was, like, living in New York, um, Mm -hmm. basically depressed. And, like, it was was nice in my small, dark uh, apartment. Yeah, because it came on at noon every day. Yes. And And I was home, 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 home. home. (laughs) Yeah, because I was waiting tables and, like, teaching at UCB, doing UCB shows. So it would have been, like, you know, I got home at between 2 and 4 a.m., like from waiting tables mm-hmm. and then slept until whatever. And then woke up a breakfast and watched starting over. <laughs> <laughs> That's very similar to my schedule because I was also teaching and doing classes at UCB and also waitressing at city crab and seafood company, oh, RIP. <laughs> was that a, <laughs> the was same that schedule? A high end deal? Yes. It was high end yeah. crabs. We would serve such dignitaries. Yes as like the the staff of high times magazine sure sure and um buster rhymes came in well, some of the cast of survivor you gotta have cash to get that crab you're not gonna <laughs> they don't serve crab and at I, burger king you know no they certainly <laughs> don't and i would upsell to the hilt where were you working i worked, where were you waitressing i waited on philip seymour hoffman r.i.p wow I served him a blue cheeseburger. Yeah. I, I served a pair. I served 10 hot wings to Nora Jones. Um, <laughs> Where I, were you working? This was the place called the Bull Moose Saloon. It was on 44th and 9th. In I love Bull Moose. I loved the Bull, Bull I, Moose. Yeah, I worked that there. Was the theater district. Yeah, I worked there for years. And then I also, then I got a job at Divine Bar because the Bull Moose was going under. Divine Bar was a mm-hmm. wine bar where you could get wine by the flight. Like you could be like, oh, I want to do Spanish red. And you would get four or five different Spanish reds in tiny little glasses. It was really cool. They were all, they had them on line. Like it was like on tap, basically wine on tap and top offs. Yeah. And they had two oh, locations. I'm trying to think, I don't think I waited on anyone famous uh, at those restaurants, but some of the people that I worked with there have become my best friends. So, yeah, yeah, that's cool. You know, I'm still friendly with people I worked with at city crab and some of them were like at my wedding and, you know, yes. like it, it translates. And, and I remember bef- right before I was there, Amanda Pete worked there was there and ev and she and she like kind of left there and got her big break and everyone was like any of us could be amanda pete like we could we're all just working to be amanda pete (laughs) i had a t-shirt that i had bought it because i was i i thought for myself i was known for like my saucy t-shirts you know and so (laughs) nobody nobody except for me (laughs) thought that but i had found at old navy yeah i was known for that i had bought at old navy a t-shirt that said just a waitress until i get recognized or something like that (laughs) that's not right i'm gonna find it i still have it i saved it but it was like just a waitress until i'm discovered or something like that yeah. And I well, wore I waitress for I like, yes. Yes. I wore my I waitress for I want to say 15 years before anything happened. And then I would get like a big break, meaning like a, an industrial in yeah. Milwaukee. And I'd be like, I'm out of here, motherfuckers. Yeah. And then I would <laughs> <laughs> quit. <laughs> I would come back like two months later oh, begging for a job. That's amazing. <laughs> It was tough times. I came back like five times to City Crab. They always let me come home. They were very kind in that way. They, as at Divine Bar, where I was at the end when I started to like get actual uh, jobs in the business, I, they, as long as you covered your shift, they didn't care. So I had two or three shifts a week. And as long as you got people to cover it, they were like, who, you know, they, it wasn't skin off their back. So um, I think I probably worked there at least one or two nights a week, like, almost until I moved here and was had a, a real time job because I didn't want to let it go because f- I was sure at any minute the the rug was going to get pulled out from under me. I was constantly letting my job go. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was constantly, like, 
this is forever. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Speaking of your career and kind of, you were talking about empathy. I do find because you play so many different characters, but I will say the, because you really do have such a huge range because you have played some really wonderful people and some pretty horrible people. Like your character on Veep is maybe the worst human being that ever is, but makes me laugh. She's so funny. Um, let's tell people, uh, in case you're under rock and you don't watch Beep, can you tell everybody about your character? Sure, sure. Her name is Karen Collins, and uh, she she specializes in common sense. That's what she says. And basically, she's just a yes woman for anything that president said i think they went to law school together now she's a lawyer so she comes in and she just echoes she just tells her what she wants to hear and she never ever would give a firm answer so she'll literally in the same sentence be like well we we could get a latte or we could go for tea you know and it's it's like <laughs> it's never giving like a concrete answer and in fact there were a lot of people like gifting it or showing the clip recently because of the recount in Nevada and Nevada. And, uh, Mm -hmm. in season, I think five, I, my character came back to be the person who said, we've got to count all the votes. And then literally an hour later was like, why are we counting these votes? We've got to stop doing this. (laughs) And it's just a, I mean, she's a trash person. I'm talking about garbage people. Yeah. Well, that's what I love because you, I do think it is your empathy and your humanity that even when you play garbage humans, they are, (laughs) they're loaded with humanity. You know what I mean? Like you recognize them. They're not just horrible. They have a level of humanity to them and you embody them with that. And I'm curious if you do that on purpose or is it just, is it just part of kind of who you are and that shows up in the characters? Like, how do you insert that? Well, I don't know. It might be some likability thing. Like I want everyone to like me no matter what I'm doing or whatever. I don't know. That might be like a pathological like thing I should talk about in therapy. But I think just in general, I find people so interesting and I'm like an observer. I'm a natural observer. So like after we go to a restaurant, Jess would always freak out because I would be able to like do a direct impression of the of the waiter and talk about like what (laughs) weird socks he had on. And she's like, I didn't even know it was a man, you know, that kind of thing. (laughs) But I just love, I just love all different kinds of people. And I, and I, I always want to know what makes them tick or how they got to where they are. Or like, you know, even people like in the current environment where we feel so divided, you know, I mean, I grew up in Mm -hmm. Georgia which just flipped. I mean, that's, that's a huge difference from when I lived there, but I'm, I was always like, I'm always interested in the motivations and why people do what they do. And I also feel like I've been around a lot of different types of people. So, you know, like in bless this mess, I felt like I was sort of, it was almost like an homage to my grandmother who was very like Mm -hmm. down to business and no messing around and but would make a joke, you know? I'm um, speaking of bless this mess. I, I know that you started directing even before that you directed a few episodes of playing house. And then you went on to direct a bunch of episodes of bless this mess. And I'm always so inspired by people that sort of pivot yeah. mid career. And I don't mean a total pivot. Obviously you're still an actress and a yeah. writer, but that's a huge deal to take on. Yeah. Um, what sort of, inspired you to do that? And is that something you are heading in a direction of wanting to do more of? Uh, for sure. Yeah. I, um, I think I've all, I think honestly, I've always been directing people and bossing people around to just come, come very <laughs> naturally. And I like to do it like also very kindly. So people don't always know that that's what's happening. Just like general encouragement, like a great mom would do. Mm-hmm. Um, but my favorite part of playing house was like the family element of it and sort of the tone on set, which I think Jess and I were really proud of creating like a a set, like a production environment where people felt valued and like they were allowed to bring their best selves and they didn't have to kind of, I hope this is true. They didn't have to like figure out what we would want. They would bring their best version and then we would kind of go from there. Um, Mm -hmm. So I, I think I've always felt, 
like like that big picture person and creating that tone on set was always just so important um and Mm -hmm. and when i and when the absence of that has been like when we haven't had a director that did that like it feels so different and so bad so i was like Mm -hmm. if we're gonna be spending all day on set together like let's do it right you know what i mean this is like a huge yeah, yeah, part yeah. of our life. Like we should be enjoying it. So yeah, I, I mean, I've directed, I used to teach, I've been a teacher. I taught high school French. I directed musicals in, in Mississippi and, uh, at that high school where I taught, I used to teach dance. I used to teach swimming. Like I've just kind of always been like a <laughs> teacher. And then, mm-hmm. um, uh, when we created our own show, I, uh, the third season was coming up and our AD was like, you guys need to direct this season. Cause it's really hard to get that first gig and you're already doing it basically. So why not have it be official? And so my first official, like legit directing job was on our show. I had a four month old. It was the first I week remember. of our third season. It was in Chatsworth, which is like forever away. And it was like torrential rains all week. And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Like this, this is insane, but I did it and I used support and, um, it's, it was a Hoosiers inspired episode, which everyone knows is my, one of my (laughs) top three films. So I was like in hog heaven. I know. I know. I loved it from the, everybody knows. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, start, stop talking about Gene Hackman. Um, and uh Bar- oh, Barbara yes, Pershing. I am still very attracted to, even though he's he may have passed at this point. He's been, he's, he's not he's still he's time. still alive and well. Um you've been keeping tabs. Yeah, I do. I keep tabs. <laughs> Thank you. And then I took a break because we were trying to figure out what our next like writing step was. But I directed a friend's like sizzle reel pilot and I was like, Yes, I love this. And then I decided I was like, I'm just gonna start saying it out loud like this is what i want i want to direct i'm going to start taking all the meetings that i'm supposed to take you know with like studios or networks or on current shows that have been up and running that might hire a first-time director and uh and once i kind of started saying it out loud it um i think i don't know i I mean the reason that i got blessed this mess i think is because lake and Liz are champions of women and women leading. Mm-hmm. And they knew they trusted me, I think, by then, because we'd already had a full season together. And um, and also Lindsay Sloan, uh, who played Bird Bones in, in Playing House, uh, knew, yes, knew that I wanted her. to direct. And she brought me up to Lake. And, and they, behind my back, like, <laughs> figured out and offered me, because they had a director cancel, and they offered it to me. And I wow. like, started screaming and freaked out. And it was, like, the perfect gig, because I already knew the crew. I knew the cast. Um, the DP was phenomenal and very helpful. And the script, I mean, just, like, you know what I mean? It was, like, the best-case scenario. Mm-hmm. And I got the comedy. I was obsessed with the show, you know, even as, like, an outsider. So, um it, it, yeah, it was great. I love what you say, and I think it's important for people in our audience to hear and for me to hear, is I started saying it out loud. I love, like, you know what I mean? Because I do think we as human beings, and especially as women, yeah. we have both that are listeners, um, but um, all types that are listeners, but um, we don't like to say it out loud because then if it's, if we say it and it someone happen. thinks badly about it or doesn't then it doesn't happen. Then all of a sudden we dreamed about something. It didn't come true. You know, it's like, it's almost like embarrassing for us. That's not the case. I think that's in our heads. So when we, and who did you start saying it out loud to friend? Like who, who, when we say our dreams out loud, who, who are we saying this to? to? I mean, the first people I said it to were my like best friends. Then I said it to, um, uh, then I called like a director that I like, think is one of the best directors that I've ever worked with and, and like asked if I could pick his brain about it. Like what were the next steps and like, what did I need to do to get prepared? And he was generous with his time and also said to me, yes, this is correct. And, um, and you just need to get a job and you need to stop preparing. 
And so I like t- took my notebook and put it away. And like, I mean, I was so, I was like, so, I mean, I was like over prepared, so over prepared. Like I didn't, I had done mm-hmm. 26 episodes of television at that point, you know? So, um, yeah, as a writer and a producer, yeah, and, an actress. and yeah. basically, a, and also basically a director. So like I knew what needed yes. to happen. And, um, so the skill was there and it just, uh, it just needed to be basically engaged as captain picard would say <laughs> they oh you don't have to say yeah <laughs> make it so right yes. <laughs> um but i find that so inspirational because i i do know that there is so much power in saying something out loud yeah um and and having it be heard and and almost like being accountable to your dream of like if once it it escapes the sort of privacy of your head and of our dear little diaries it um it becomes real and we sort of become accountable to it even if it doesn't happen in the way we thought it would or whatever you know or, or the way we dreamed it it still becomes real once you put it out sound that's so powerful i think to just to, to say out loud like where you want to be gets you moving in a direction and other people thinking that you're moving in that direction and whether or not you end up going to the one place that you said you were going to go or that you wanted to be, you are in action and like other doors open for you and Mm -hmm. people see you as someone on the way. So they're like, Oh, I want to be involved with that person. Who's making shit happen. Even if you're like every step of the way, like, is this right? Should I be doing this? I'm not funny. Uh, Will anybody want to see this? Does anybody think that my voice, like what I have to say is, you know, funny and it's like well just just activate you know get on the get on the train do you think of as you've gotten older um as we all are slowly getting older in our houses and in our skin yeah um do you think that (laughs) in our squat power i'm not not, i don't have a lot of strength in my squats anymore (laughs) as i discovered with my four-year-old none of us do getting up off the control floor Oh, um, but do you think that some of that, um, do you think you've gotten more secure in that sort of like abandonment of like, I'm just gonna, even if I have doubts, I'm just gonna throw it at the wall. Has that been easier as you've gotten older, do you think, or harder? Like, because on some level, it's like, do we have more to lose now? We have families, we have bills, you Mm -hmm. know, as opposed to when we were 25. I think I, I think I value myself more than I used to. Like, I think I have been treated well and I've been treated poorly. And now that I've been treated well, like, I probably won't go back to being treated poorly again, if that makes sense. Like, yes, that makes all the sense because you know what, what yeah, it feels I mean, like. or what I'm capable of. Uh, like, I don't know. I mean, there's this thing where you think, like you said, like, you book the industrial in Milwaukee and you're like, this is it. Right. And I think when you're, (laughs) when you're just starting out or even, I mean, within like, cause it probably took me at least, it took me 10 years in New York to get like a, a real job or eight or nine years, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, Mm -hmm. that's a long time to hustle without any like success or payment or any, you know what I mean? So when you're first starting out, you think like literally any open door could be the correct path. Right. And if you say no to mm-hmm. something, uh, it's like you could be saying no to the one avenue that's going to get you where you're going, which is I found the more I said no, the clearer I got about where I wanted to be, the quicker I got where I wanted to be. So if I'm saying yes. no to like the music video with the dude who's like got a garage in hell's kitchen, like, (laughs) you know, or, or even in, in some cases, like a basement production of the tempest or whatever, like, am I, is that going to be my path? Is that what my special skills are? No. Like, and so once you started, once I started to say like, no, that won't get me like closer to the thing that I say that I want, whether or not I even get that. Mm -hmm. Um, because like when I started out, I didn't want to executive produce my own television show. I didn't really even know that was possible to be honest. Mm -hmm. The thing I saw was people on SNL and I was like, I want to do that. I want to do sketch comedy. 
like my friends are getting on it. Like that makes sense. I've been obsessed with SNL from the time and now, and I didn't get on SNL, but I did my one woman show with SNL style characters. People were like, Oh, she's funny. She should audition for this pilot, you know? And then that led me to this thing that led me to this thing. So it, it doesn't have to necessarily be the right decision that you're even going towards it just has to be something. If that makes sense. And it is so funny because when you're starting out, you think like, this is the dream. And if I don't get this dream, I'm just going to die or yeah. I'm just going to, my life is going to be over. Or it, I'm a failure. But it's like, yeah, I think I too was like SNL. I, I want to be on SNL. And then as you start to get better at whatever it is your talent is or yeah. your zone is, yeah. then you like, I realized like, oh, I'm, I don't think I am SNL. Like, I know I'm funny, yeah. but I don't think that's the right place for me in this thing, this podcast. Right. <laughs> is the way. Me talking about reality stars is really my zone. <laughs> yes, <laughs> or it whatever. is. And you do it better um, than anybody. And obviously people are rabid for it because they feel they connect to you and they connect to that story and they connect to this connection that you have with these people mm -hmm. on, in Potomac. Mm -hmm. Is that how you say it? <laughs> Thank you. The fact that you know it's in Potomac tells me that your eyes and ears are listening, even though you do. It's in the zeitgeist. Thou, thou it's in protest. the zeitgeist. Thou dost protest too much, Lennon, Par Lennon Marie Parham. I don't know if that's your real name. You know what? I, I do. I remember now what I was saying. When you feel like you, every, you think that there's going to be like a peak, right? A thing that you, once you mm -hmm. reach it, you're done right but yes. that is there are so many levels of especially even in this town like celebrity or success or doors that will open because of who you are or whatever and you may not ever be aware of like who like who, who you're gonna what door you're gonna be able to open if that makes sense right mm -hmm. so like yeah you think you're supposed to be once you do this particular thing then the rest will be easy. And that's just not, mm -hmm. that's not how life works. So instead of like setting some insane goal for yourself that like, once you get to this one place, you're going to be happy. Once you get on mm -hmm. SNL or whatever, you're going to be happy. You've got to figure out like, well, what is it that I'm doing right today? Does that make me happy? Like, Working on yeah. this one woman show was hard, but it, it did make me happy and it satisfied me in a way that like I had not been satisfied because I was really listening to what I thought specifically was funny. And I found myself in this crazy like basement theater world, you know, in the middle of the night, like making laughing harder than I'd ever laughed before with all of these like, you know, misfit toys, you know, so <laughs> Um, and I saw that show and it's truly one of the funniest. Uh, I wish, do you have it on? It's online. Sort of DVD? <laughs> it's online. I think it, well, I mean, it used to be on the UCB website or on YouTube or something, but it's, it, uh, I don't know. It's I mean, I don't know it. if it holds up. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't remember mm -hmm. what, which, ep, which version was taped, but it was not, I don't think it necessarily holds up. It was so funny. I, I was lucky enough to see it, I think, a few times at UCB. And it was true. You played, like, a banana solid gold dancer. And I think yes. some of our audience might be younger than solid gold. But I remember it well. <laughs> she was, yeah. I remember. She was, um, <laughs> her name was Sandy Michelson. And she was an understudy at Solid Gold. And right, right before she got her break to go on, she shattered her pelvis. And so she never actually <laughs> performed on the show, <laughs> but she grew up. I mean, she, you know, she grew older, got like a, had an, Ill, an illegitimate child named Christian and um, lived in Costa Mesa and taught jazz dance to like TK through third graders. But it was, it was incredibly sexual. And then throughout is like, <laughs> The sketch was just her pitching to the parents, like why you should take, why your kids should take dance with me. And throughout she smoked a Capri cigarette and she drank <laughs> like half a bottle of white Zinfandel Franzia out of a box and just, <laughs> just disintegrated before your eyes. Oh, it was so beautiful to behold. I mean, that <laughs> I, I would like to see where she is today. Like where? She's exactly she... the same place. 
I know. I'm not done with her yet. I don't know if she's done with us. Online classes or something. Oh, yeah. How has she been holding up during the during the old pandemic? <laughs> <laughs> I think just well, right as rain, her and her cat are having a having a, a YouTube show or yeah, something. She's gonna like make it out of the Armageddon for sure. <laughs> Um, one last thing I just want to talk to you a little bit about Drag Race because I know some of our listeners are oh yeah um, huge fans of it and I know you're a huge fan can you tell everybody yeah. if they haven't watched what's the best season who are the best like what's the best season of Drag Race you've ever seen mm. what should people be watching for the last couple of seasons have really like taken it to the next level although like the season with Katya was really good um, I also like all the all stars, but I feel like you kind of need to have watched the earlier seasons to like fully understand all stars. This last mm-hmm. season of all stars was really epic. I, the, I mean, the part of it that really like keeps me coming back for more is when they're putting their makeup on and they're talking about how hard it has been to do this thing that they're deeply in love with. Like how they've mm-hmm. had to push through some of them lost family members, you know, because because they want to live this way, but they're living this way. And they're it's also so specific to voice like Crystal Method was in a recent season and she was <laughs> like, I mean, it's hard to reinvent the wheel as far as drag goes. You would think it's like there's classic mm-hmm. drag. There's like there's pageant queens. There's like. celebrity queens who like do impressions there's i mean there's body queens it's it's crazy but there's Mm -hmm. also if this is something maybe you haven't seen you might be a drag race fan but you don't know about this show it's called legendary so if you've seen paris is burning which is oh yes documentary about the The best movie of all time right so it's pose is sort of set in that world but um, legendary is a ballroom competition, not ballroom dance, ballroom like house, house, um, like like voguing, like whacking. Uh, it is there are multiple houses that compete, and I just like literally was obsessed with it. So the house of Lanvin, the house of Gucci, is the house of La Beja still with us? No, these were, maybe they were houses that were made specifically for Legendary. I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay. I haven't really connected the dots from Paris is Burning to Legendary, but you will recognize, I think, some of the, like, players, if that makes sense. And where can we find Legendary? It's on HBO. Right on it's on HBO Max. And every week there's like a different, uh, a different, uh, like theme, like intergalactic Mm -hmm. or, uh, yeah, Mm -hmm. or, or like, like back in time or, I mean, they're just, they're so fun. And there's a guy who's freestyling. He's in, he's an actor from Pose and he's also a house. He's also competes in ballroom and, um, my husband got obsessed with him. So this is like a show for you, for the whole family. (laughs) And, but he's okay. like, he, there was a, there was one that was called, there was a competition where there were two people from each side and one had to be like soft and feminine and one had to have drama. So Ooh. they come out and, uh, and they're, they're all like competing against each other. The judges are phenomenal. I mean, it's just like, it's, it's like the best show. And the guy who is also the host is also freestyling the whole time. So he's like, first oh, wow. there's feminine, then there's drama. First there's feminine, then there's drama, <laughs> drama, drama, drama. And you're just like, what the? F-? And and there's there's big like strong men who are trained in dance, and there's there's women. There's one team of all women. I don't know. It's just like sounds incredible. Like I would love. So that. it's about acceptance. It's about acceptance. They don't get into like the backstory like they do on Drag Race. But it's it really is truly about acceptance and seeing this form that these people love, like raised into the limelight. And it's it's so meaningful to them. And so I was like, I'm here for this. I love this. <laughs> Lennon Parham, thank you so much for coming on Bonus Sesh. I'm, you know, a fan and a friend. Um, and ditto. Um, where can people find you? Find your you're on Insta. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's at Lennon Parham on both, on all are you platforms. No, 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 no. That's for the younger gens. <laughs> well, I love you. You're the best. I love you too. Um, you're, 
the funniest and the smartest. And thank you so much for coming on today. You're gonna, I appreciate it. Yeah, of course.